Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Jonathan Stein, uh, Managing Editor of Project Syndicate. I'm going to sit at this end of the um, table because uh, my right ear is better than my left ear, and I'd like to hear what everybody um, is saying. Uh, today we have a, um, a very distinguished and I think uh, important and I hope interesting panel um, comprising um, uh, uh, Marius Dragomir, who is the uh, director of the Center for Media, Data, and Society. Uh, we have uh, Martin Gergay, the editor of the newspaper HVG, and Andreas Peto, who's the co-founder and editor of Direct 136, sitting directly to my right. Um, and one of the reasons why I think this panel is so important in talking about Hungary in particular, and the media situation in Hungary is, uh, is so important, is because in many ways Hungary um, was a pioneer of the kind of populist nationalism that we've seen uh, rising throughout Europe, uh, and then that really came to a head with the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump uh, as president in the US in, in, in 2016. And there are certain key components of this, um, this trend and this type of governance uh, that have, that have, have um, appeared and reappeared uh, in all of the countries where um, this kind of populism has strengthened and, and uh, succeeded at the polls. And uh, Hungary is, uh, it really is a country that uh, embodies many of these types of, um, of political strategies on the part of uh, populist authoritarians, nationalist populist authoritarians. And uh, um, Viktor Orban, the, the Prime Minister uh, of Hungary, is very well aware of this, uh, and he has uh, 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 talked of the of the uh, of the uh, his desire to create an illiberal state and a liberal democracy. Uh, one of the key features is that the ruling party uh, um, claims to speak. At, uh, uh, on behalf of the nation uh, and, uh, and uh, divides uh, the, the electorate and, and, and the citizens of a country into uh, patriots and traitors. And, um, uh, and Orban has done this extremely skillfully. Uh, uh, another key feature institutionally is the centralization of control. Uh, and that has taken place in Hungary under an education law that centralized all of the uh, control over the schools, uh, uh, attacks on uh, the independence of the central bank. Um, uh, because uh, the Orban's uh, party, the ruling party, Fides, has a two-thirds majority in the, uh, in, in the Hungarian parliament, it has been able to basically um, neuter the, the constitutional court in Hungary, which uh, in the 90s was one of the most powerful uh, and interesting constitutional courts in, uh, in Europe. Um, since then, uh, uh, the, anything that has been rejected by the constitutional court, which has been much legislation, is then simply constitutionalized, adopted as a constitutional law by a two-thirds majority in the parliament, and, uh, and, and the Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court, is, uh, is out of the picture. Um, today, we're going to focus on one particular aspect of this uh, drive towards the establishment of, a, uh, of illiberal democracy, and that's the media law that was adopted in 2010, despite much protest uh, by, uh, by uh, European and international, other international institutions, uh, which has centralized control over, um, over uh, 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 media organizations, especially public television, I think three channels of, of public television, uh, national radio as well. And, and, and alongside this, an attempt by Orban, a very successful attempt, effective attempt, to uh, create alternative media, private media, based on uh, oligarchs who are politically loyal to, uh, to the government. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to the panelists so we can start talking about uh, some of this, what it's like to uh, work under such a regime, and, uh, and what, if any, strategies of resistance um, are, are, a, 
available. Um, so uh, so let's let's start with you, uh, uh, Martin, and, uh, and uh, talking a little bit about what has happened since 2010, how it's affected uh, news reporting, um, and uh, uh, how you operate under this under this kind of regime. Well, <clears throat> it's such a long time, uh, those nine years, that, uh, that if I start to speak about it, I don't know where to start. Um, in 2016, uh, I used to be uh, a deputy editor-in-chief of Nép uh, that time the biggest newspaper of Hungary, uh, which was closed. Um, and uh, I started to talk about it. And I realized after only a year that the situation has got so much worse that I'm not really speaking about Népszabadság anymore. Um, so I don't know where to start. Um, I wanted to give you a short introduction because I think it's, it's uh, interesting in this panel that we are um, representing two approaches of critical uh, journalism with András. András uh, leading a small investigative team uh, of journalists uh, uh, being a very independent uh, 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 group of journalists and I'm representing the last dinosaurs um, and uh, you know I, I use the word dinosaurs because I know what where, where the, the, the story is heading uh, but uh, I realized the the last couple of years how important those dinosaurs are still uh, uh, still are um, so, three years ago, uh, so it all started um, for us, not with the media law, for the critical newspapers and uh, those dinosaurs, but, and, and I talk about dinosaurs uh, because of size and not of age. Right. All right, so it, it can be a new founded media outlet. If it's above, let's say, 25 people uh, who are in the editorial team, that's a dinosaur for me. Um, 25, that's, that, that, that's now, uh, you know, where, where we stand. Um, so it started five years back as, um, as Andras' uh, news portal uh, was decapitated by uh, a foreign firm uh, and uh, uh, the best journalists uh, quitted their job uh, and uh, uh, Origo, the news portal, which used to be number one, uh, became uh, a zombie, a living dead. Uh, two years later, Nebsovacek was shut down again. Uh, and uh, uh, A foreign investor played a key uh, role in that. Um, and that paper was buried. Um, and then uh, a year ago, uh, Magyar Nemzet, a traditional newspaper, uh, which, uh, well, enjoyed four years of critical uh, journalism uh, uh, ahead of the 2018 vote, um, was closed down. Again, uh, an editorial team of more than 25 uh, critical journalists um, had to, uh, well, uh, say goodbye to their jobs. Uh, and uh, this means that for a lot of them, actually quitting uh, journalism. Um, and uh, this uh, week ends the story of Here TV, which uh, also had a four-year uh, critical uh, period, uh, as the oligarch who was behind it uh, played a high game, uh, a high-stake poker game with uh, Mr. Orban, uh, his former friend, and lost. Uh, so Here TV had to uh, be shut down. Uh, well, the critical uh, part of it. Uh, it started last August, uh, and this week uh, the hairstylists were also fired who, uh, who were there as uh, a short period of critical journalism was um, done there. So um, if, if I only look at the, at the newspapers, the dailies, we had three years back, uh, as Nev Sovacha was still running, uh, five newspapers, three, tri three critical and two in favor of the government. Right now we have three newspapers, two in favor of the government, and one critical but partly compromised. Um, 
So this is this this is where we stand. Um, why do I think that that the dinosaurs are important? It's it's because uh, media is an ecosystem. Um, dinosaurs are needed one to put up pressure uh, on those who are caught. Uh, so there are no investigative journalism. Th 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 there's no consequence if there's no pressure. If there's no pressure from the side of the voters who are in favor of that politician. And if, uh, as in Hungary, uh, a huge part of the Hungarian media in favor of the Hungarian government is not seeing uh, wrong or right, uh, can't, uh, can't, can't decide, uh, can't see any wrongdoings from the side of the government, there can't be pressure. And if the remaining critical uh, uh, newspapers can't uh, reach enough people, there's no pressure building up. So it means there are no consequences. The other thing is that, that, that it's very rare that uh, an investigative uh, piece uh, is born as uh, the patron goddess of ancient Athens, uh, you know, jumping out in full body armor out of the forehead of the creator. Um, it's, it's, it, it's uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it comes from bits and pieces. There's the f first big bombshell, uh, and then the others big, they take a, a big part because such big teams have more sources and, and, and you know, have, they, they don't know the, <laughs> perhaps they, they can't go deep and, and, and they don't uh, uh, know, but, but, but if the, 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 the bomb is out there and, and the five most important people are asked, perhaps they know the sixth import, most important person and they ask it ask him. So, so it, it is a constant flow to build up a real scandal and you need uh, the dinosaurs to have that. Um, so this is, these are the two, two, two uh, important uh, factors. Uh, and then what is killing us as dinos? Uh, first of all, the finances, uh, that we are robbed of our own success. Um, that we have to pay uh, an advertisement tax uh, with which we are currently financing our uh, competitors from the government side. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, if, if we would have the same percentage of advertisement revenue as a Western European uh, weekly has with the same reach, um, we could afford about 20% more people. 20% less people means uh, more uh, administrative work, more, uh, you know, annoying work, uh, less time to be out on the streets, to be among people. So we l lose touch to, to everyday Hungary um, and we, we lose the possibility to, dry, to, to, to write the deep stories. Um, second, there is a lack of information uh, because, uh, because uh, not only the government and the politicians, but also every state uh, uh, inst institution are not talking to us, so they are not giving answers. Um, I had this uh, experience once that a Hungarian uh, tabloid was bringing two suspicious stories, one in Germany, one in Hungary. Uh, and I wanted to fact check them because this is, this is what a dinosaur should do, right. fact checking. Uh, and uh, I called the German police and within five minutes I've been, uh, uh, you know, I, I've reached uh, uh, a spokesperson of the Pforzheim police, or I don't know where it was, and they gave me the, the, the truth behind the story. Uh, then I tried to fact check the Hungarian story, and the Hungarian police said, write us an email. And then they answered three weeks later, uh, with not answering my questions, of course. So if you are working in an environment where you can't fact check things because the institutions are relying on the fake news the government is spreading. Your number one goal is somehow lost. And this, this brings a tsunami of opinion writing because this, this helps the revenue, it helps the clicks. Yeah. It is the easy way to go forward. And, and you know, you are ruining at the same time uh, the, the public discourse because 
you should bring the facts, but you don't have them. And then number three is the no impact thing that I've already mentioned, that there is no pressure building up. And it means that, that, that in the Hungarian media right now, we are only having anonymous sources, yeah. which is a huge problem because it, 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 it works against of the credibility of what we are reporting on. So that's the okay. positive uh, <laughs> little summary of, <laughs> of where uh, we let stand. Me, let, me, let me turn it over to Andras and, and, and ask you what, um, what your experience has been with online media and, and, and uh, you know, has, has it been different from working for a, a, a dinosaur? Uh, or, or is it largely the same? Um, what have the challenges been? First of all, thank you for thank you for coming. I mean, if you if you want to listen to three white men complaining for an hour, then you came to the right place. <laughs> we are Hungarians. Well, Mario is an honor honorary Hungarian. Uh, we are really good at uh, complaining. And uh, uh, yes, so uh, uh, I, I, I promise I, I will be brief, but. Uh, I think uh, to understand what happened in Hungary with the media, with the news industry, we need to go back uh, at least uh, till uh, like 2008 to the financial financial crisis. Uh, as you, I mean, everybody knows here at this uh, festival that you know the news industry had been in, disrupted by some of the sponsors of this conference, but. <laughs> Uh, and uh, by by others by the by the internet, and then so when the, the the financial crisis hit, the media had been already in a in a weak uh, position, and then the crisis accelerated the, those uh, 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 worsened those those problems. So in 2010, when uh, Orban Viktor Orban came back to power by a landslide uh, victory, then. Uh, the media, the Hungarian media especially, was in a really bad shape. And uh, uh, just to understand it a little bit more, I did, the, his party, Orban's party, has always had a kind of contentious relationship with the, with the press. They thought that the, the media uh, treated them unfairly uh, and that the media had a liberal bias. Uh, and, uh, well, I think... I think there was some truth to that, to be honest. I mean, as far as I can, I, I can recall from the 90s and the early 2000s. And uh, so apparently they decided to settle the score when they came back to power. So I think they even the, it was probably, the, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the, f the first, very first legislation that they introduced in uh, uh, after uh, winning the election. Uh, uh, the, it was the media or the new media constitution, as they called it. And they, what they changed with, what they did with that was that they changed the whole regulatory landscape. They, they set up new regulatory bodies. They appointed their own, own people, people loyal to them to lead those. Uh, bodies and then the next step was to take over the public media which has always been under the control of the government to some extent but but I think in fact uh, in the the years leading up to 2010 they did a pretty pretty good job especially the public radio but then uh, so they uh, they in just a few years they turned the public media the news agency the the radio the tv channels into a mouthpiece uh, of for the government and then then came the 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 private media i was uh, i was lucky enough to have worked at the the, this uh, a digital company that became the first target of this uh, crackdown it was this uh, uh, it was a big, also a dinosaur. By uh, uh, if you accept the definition of uh, Martin, the uh, uh, Origo, a big digital company, uh, the leading news website of uh, Hungary, and uh, which had been a really good place to do journalism. I spent most of my career there, more than ten years, and I really enjoyed working there. We had total freedom and independence in uh, reporting about uh, politics or uh, any kind of sensitive issues. But then around 2013, uh, we realized that things were changing. Uh, Origo, this company, was owned by uh, uh, telecom, uh, this, the Hungarian subsidiary of Deutsche Telekom. So 
For a long time, it seemed like uh, it was a good idea to have a, a big telecommunications company as an owner because it seemed to be it's a huge company. I mean, Deutsche Telekom is uh, as big as Hungary, so we thought that nobody would mess with a, a telecommunications company. I mean, now we know that it's not a good idea to have a telecommunications company as an owner because you know they are all there are all kinds of links between that industry and the government anywhere anywhere in the world. So apparently the, the company came under pressure from the government. Uh, there were some special taxes on the, on the industry. So after a while we started to feel pressure, but a different kind of pressure than, than previously. I mean, I, this is, I, 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 I borrowed this from my former editor, Balazs Weyer, who said once that you know, for journalists complaining about uh, pressure is like you know, as if miners were complaining about darkness. It's, uh, it's part of the job, I mean. Uh, but the, the problem is when the pressure is coming from the inside, from your own, from your own company. Uh, it's not the politicians who are attacking you, it's not the, the, the PR people or lawyers, but it's your own management, your own CEO that is putting pressure on you to drop, drop stories. And this is what happened in our case at Origo in 2014 when, uh, as I was pursuing a pretty routine story that the government didn't like, and then uh, I, uh, my, uh, the CEO of the company, Forigo, uh, came with really strange requests uh, to us, like they wanted to remove certain stories, and so we and we didn't give in to that pressure. Then, uh, uh, then this whole thing exploded, and my my editor in chief was uh, forced out of his job, and then uh, I resigned, and many other people people resigned from the uh, newsroom, and uh, and then Origo since then uh, had. Uh, has has become ba it's uh, basically the digital flagship new site of this propaganda machine that the that the government uh, built because as i mentioned that was just the first target then uh, many others followed uh, nape sabachak the f the former outlet uh, of uh, martin uh, was uh, shut down in a pretty brutal way as part of a takeover when the, the, the publisher of Nape Savacak was taken over by uh, an oligarch, a uh, friend of uh, Orban. And, and then uh, and there were several other examples, uh, TV stations, other news sites, magazines, they all came under the control of the, uh, not directly the government, mostly if you can call them oligarchs or businessmen who are friends of, uh, of, of Orban. And it's, it's pretty fascinating actually what they, what they did because now they built uh, an, 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 an entirely new uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, it's, uh, the Hungarian media has always been very partisan. You know, they were always left wing, right wing. Uh, so it's, I mean, uh, Origo was, and that's why I liked Origo, Origo so much because Origo tried to stay in the middle of the road for a very long time. We didn't pu didn't even publish uh, opinion pieces, and uh, so, but but still, despite that partisanship, it was the it was the same ecosystem. If one side broke a big story, and if it was a really big story, then then eventually it was picked up by by the other side as well, and then so. Uh, uh, and now it's uh, in this pro pro Orban. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> pro Orban. He's showing something, but I don't understand. You cannot hear. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, they say that you can hear me. Ah, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think just continue. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, now the this the, the pro government uh, ecosystem with its TV channels, with its with its websites, with its radio stations. First of all, it's very it's not it's not really functioning as a as a journalism uh, organization. It's uh, you can see that it's uh, even the language, the, how they pick stories. It's very, very much orchestrated, uh, and, and 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 we know that it, that it is. It's not it, 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 it's uh, it's not that it just looks like as if it yeah. was orchestrated. It's it's orchestrated, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, even if they 
pick up stories from uh, the the rest of the media that is independent from the government it's those stories appear in a very distorted uh, form uh, very often they are turned upside down uh, so yeah, if i if i was a if i was an academic or researcher i, would, I really i would i would spend uh, time on researching how this hungarian system uh, works and how it was built in a in a in a nominally you know uh, functioning democracy uh, actually by using some western money because some of these oligarchs who owned and bought these outlets you know they they got rich through eu funds so it's a very it's a very uh, interesting topic but to if i if i have one more minute to, yeah. to tell a uh, little bit about uh, ourselves so after we left origo that new site then we uh, with my colleagues, uh, with the editor-in-chief who was fired for forced out of his job, Gerd Schaling and others, uh, we set up our own organization, uh, uh, a nonprofit, an investigative reporting center. It's called uh, Direct uh, 36, and we 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 made two choices at the the beginning. One was that we we didn't want to become another big news site. Why uh, Direct 36? Is there some significance th 30, to the name? 36 refers to the country code uh, of Hungary. It's a it's a Hungarian uh, project. Although we publish our stories in English uh, in English too, if you can, if you want to check our website. So that we we wanted to do only investigative reporting. I wanted to work on long-term projects. That was partly because, well, personally, we were more you know uh, attracted to that form of uh, journalism. But it was also because we knew that we just couldn't raise enough money. We, could ju we just couldn't get uh, enough uh, capital investment to to launch another dinosaur, another big uh, uh, news organization. And the other uh, decision that we made was that we, we, we would run this as a, as a non-profit because we learned from our experience at Origo that the, uh, the, the political pressure is very often exercised through financial uh, means, through the owner, through the advertisements, through contracts. Gotcha. So yeah, yes, so we wanted to, wanted to avoid that. So we, we set up the organization as a, as a nonprofit, and uh, we, from the very beginning, we, I mean, we got grants from foundations, but we also launched a crowdfunding campaign at the beginning, and now uh, our membership base is, uh, is, is, uh, is basically where most of our revenue is, uh, is coming from. So uh, I think that, that gives us the, the biggest possible freedom uh, in our reporting in Hungary. You uh, you mentioned that uh, you know if you were an academic or a researcher you would investigate how this um, this structure of control has been set up. And fortunately, on our panel, we do have an academic and researcher who can uh, uh, possibly address that. I hope address address that topic. And in particular, both of you, uh, you know, uh, I think really highlighted the role of. Um, particular types of publications in constituting an ecosystem, a media ecosystem. And you know, you see this in uh, other countries that have remained, at least for now, uh, uh, democracies, you know, where there's a free, uh, a, a free press and there will be leading uh, outlets of that press that set the agenda, uh, whether they have better, more resources or better reporters for whatever reason, they break the stories that other editors of other newspapers, you know, that's what they read in the morning and they say, aha, this is what we should focus on. This is, uh, you know, something that either we should, I should assign a reporter to cover uh, to find out more about this or we should commission, you know, a commentary on this or, or something like that. How does this exactly work in Hungary? How is the news agenda set? Uh, and how is that news agenda pursue, enforced and pursued? You can go first, Martin, and then, and then uh, if, you want to talk to, uh, if you want to talk to that, speak to that. But, but I, I, I want to give, um, give Marius a, a, sure. a, a chance yeah. to speak. Um, well, I, 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 think, uh, I think you can address that um, more easily because you are involved in that. We were talking before the, the panel about uh, the fact that they are taking the heat and 
I'm studying how they are taking the feed, which is a very comfortable situation. But uh, talking about uh, Hungary and this uh, media ecosystem that Andras talked about, and he, he explained how, how it worked, we have a, we have a concept to, de to define it, and that's called media capture. Uh, it is, a, it is a, an academic concept, but very useful and with a lot of uh, practical use, uses, in fact, uh, to really understand how, um, uh, how capture of independent media works in, in these days where technology uh, is thriving and apparently everything is possible because of the internet. Um, so let me just refer first of all to the law that you mentioned, you started with that, uh, adopted back in 2010 in Hungary. I think although the, that law, that legal uh, package didn't have a direct impact on the, the work of journalists throughout this decade, I think it's really important because first of all, at the time I remember well, uh, it had a chilling effect on, on journalists because of the uh, uh, the vague provisions that it put forward and the, the punishments against journalists. Uh, but secondly, and more importantly, I think the law was very important because in a way it legitimized uh, all these efforts of the governments during the past nine, ten years to, to take over media outlets, to, to change the regulatory systems, to take, to take over the public media system. So it's very important, and this is a, uh, an important uh, specificity of uh, of the media capture uh, uh, model across many countries in Eastern Europe that, that we are studying, the fact that they are trying to do that with a legal, uh, with a legal justification behind. Uh, and that is very tricky because it's very, sometimes it's very hard to fight these governments on the, those grounds because they always come, come back to you with, with legal, uh, with legal uh, arguments. Um, the secondly, I, what I just want to, uh, to, to say is that this was uh, based on the research that we have done on Hungary uh, and other countries in the region. This was a very systematic uh, effort. It was, not, uh, it was not a chaotic effort of a government trying to take over one, two media outlets and to ensure control of the media for one, two years. It was a systematic uh, uh, effort, a, method, a methodical effort to actually control as much, not all, this is very interesting, not all the media, but as much uh, of the media uh, uh, market as possible to ensure just one thing, the fact that they win elections every four years and they keep um, access over the public resources. So that's, that's I think, quite, quite important to, uh, to say. Uh, now, a few, uh, talking about a few other characteristics of this model and uh, trends in, in, in media capture in, in Hungary and how it works, I think it has a logic and it is a very, at the same time, while it's systematic and methodical, it's also very sophisticated because uh, as, as we heard here, first of all, they, they changed the, the legislation and the first thing was to, to change the regulatory structures. That was a very easy, uh, easy task because in fact they had control over those, uh, those uh, structures. Th those people were appointed by the government. The second step had also a logic. They took over the public service media. I remember back in the day the coverage from Hungary where lots of journalists had to leave the public service media because it was taken over, uh, well-funded and transformed into a state. Uh, into a state institution. And again, that was very easy because they appointed the people at the helm of the stations. Um, and then what took longer was the takeover of the media, uh, the private media companies. That was more difficult because you had foreign owners in the country who were not so easily uh, bought. Uh, you had uh, various interests. You had quite a diverse at the time uh, media market and that took uh, a longer time. And it was done either through direct uh, uh, deals and purchases of media outlets through pressures in, in many cases, but some, sometimes when they couldn't actually take over a media outlet, they, they shut it down as we had examples in, in recent years. And, and fourthly, a, a very important uh, element of this model is the, the money, the, the funding. Um, you have seen, and there is a lot of research done by local think tanks in Hungary about the state advertising and the, the, the public funding that is used by the government in the media. That is extremely important because of the problems that media outlets are facing in Hungary. And you see suddenly after 2010, within two, one, two, three years probably, a major shift of the, the public funding uh, from a number of outlets. Some, somehow they were getting this funding based on, some, uh, on a set of very uh, concrete uh, principles principles, you see a shift in this funding towards, of course, uh, friendlier media outlets that were at the same time taken over by oligarchs. So there is a, uh, this, is, this is a model and it's, it's quite sophisticated, quite complex, but a model that really works because first of all it gives you the feeling that you are still in a free market, you can open any media outlet in Hungary, correct me if you are wrong, 
but you operate in a system where actually uh, a group of people, and not necessarily the government, but a group of people connected with the government and, and media owners and the, the oligarchy of Hungary actually has power over all the, the major means of funding and controlling a media outlet in, in a sense. So that's, uh, that's how I see this model. It's, it's Hungary, unfortunately, is a pioneer in that. It, it pioneered this model. I think more, uh, more importantly is to look at uh, other countries in the region and outside Europe, actually, that are looking and uh, replicating that model or parts of that. Uh, but just three things very quickly about why this is important and three, three characteristics of the, of the beast, to call it that way, that are, are important to look into. First of all, we always had in Europe, and uh, not only in Eastern Europe, problems with the concentration of ownership. We always had very powerful media outlets taking a lot of the market share, the, uh, a big part of the advertising spending in, in many countries. What is changing with this media capture and the, the Orban oligarchy model is the fact that we shift towards a concentration of influence, which is more important because it involves control over money, funding people in various positions, structures, and so on. The second, I think it's uh, very important to, to look into the fact that uh, the walls between the state and the, the market are broken, at least in the media, but in many other fields. I'm not getting into that because it's a, it's a very long story. But in the media, in fact, uh, all these takeovers of media outlets, some, sometimes you don't even know who's who there because it's either an oligarch connected with Orban, but you cannot actually prove many times that he actually is close to Orban. Sometimes he's a company connected with other oligarchs. So basically you have, you have a group of people in power that are moving freely between the government as if the government was a private institution and private companies who actually have access who to, act like to public the state. administration. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, at some point you don't actually know who's who because they operate into, into a much bigger, bigger structure. And that leads me to the third point, which is the fact that uh, uh, such a structure, in fact, at the end of the day, denies the independent media the, the role that it should play in, in society because it transform, it tends to transform at least not all the media, but at least part of the media into an institution. And there was a major development in Hungary uh, last fall, I think, where most of uh, these oligarchs with, with media outlets uh, uh, controlling media outlets decided to create a, a much bigger structure where they would actually donate <laughs> yes. donate their media assets to a bigger foundation that would operate as an institution. A thing that actually reminds us, I don't know, I, I, sound, I might sound very old now, but it reminds us of the old days be, before 1919 in communist Eastern Europe where actually you had one institution mm -hmm. in place taking care of that. So I think these are just a few things just to, 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 to look at the, the Hungarian model that are also very importantly seen in other countries. I, I wonder if, if uh, the two of you, the practitioners, can, can address this. I mean, I, I, I think uh, this sounds right that this was a very methodical effort simply because the media law was one of the first major pieces of legislation that the new government in 2010 at the time, uh, the new government uh, uh, proposed. And it seems that, you know, after Orban unexpectedly lost in 2002, he was determined not to have this happen again and viewed media and to some extent the education system as key levers of his long-term uh, electoral success. Now clearly, and I don't want to get into any kind of finger pointing, but to build this kind of system or to subvert this kind of system, you need willing people on the inside. You need, you need people who know the media, right, who've practiced in the media. Uh, and how has that played out? Has the media itself, have the media, it's, uh, you know, themselves, these outlets in, in Hungary become polarized uh, by the government, and how do you um, how do you view each other professionally? Thank you for bringing this up, because uh, one of the because we we've been having these discussions like uh, the, about the government government pressure and uh, how the the Orban uh, uh, reshaped the whole whole industry. But uh, I think we are talking. Uh, we are not talking enough about the the, the role uh, journalists played in this, and why was it so easy for Orban to crush the media? Why is it so hard to recover? 
and uh, I think that uh, you know I think we we really need to take a hard look at ourselves and uh, uh, you know and, and especially in what went wrong before 2010 uh, you know in the in the United States when I know that their media system is not perfect either uh, you know after Trump's election you could see the Trump bumps in uh, uh, the subscriptions of uh, several outlets. In Hungary, there was no Orban bump at all. I mean, uh, now after several years, you know, uh, uh, many outlets are trying to turn to the audience and they try to raise money uh, like that through membership programs and subscriptions. And uh, I mean, there is some hope. I mean, our organization, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty small one. So we are okay, we are surviving on having a, 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 a membership uh, program with uh, a couple of thousand people. But, uh, but even the bigger ones who raise money, try to raise money like this, I think as far as I can see, they struggle to uh, recruit, you know, more than uh, five, six, seven thousand uh, uh, people, and uh, you know, it's Hungary is a small country. It has only ten million people, but I mean, you would expect that there would be more, more people to willing to contribute to. Think. And why did it, why they don't see the value? And I think that because we didn't show them the value, and maybe we didn't do our job uh, very well even before before two thousand and ten. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I think that should that should change. I mean, I mean, uh, if we if one day this is this is over, I mean, we should emerge stronger from this and not you know weaker. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's a credibility problem uh, on the side of the critical media, um, and this credibility problem uh, can uh, be uh, how shall I say? Um, so, so I think you mentioned 2002, you mentioned 2008, and perhaps there's another date uh, in between 2006, what we should mention. Um, and it was uh, that the whole Hungarian intellectual elite, uh, the media elite, was obsessed with Orban. And, um, and it was the 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 the, the left wing part of it, the liberal part was what it, of it was uh, happy to forgive anything to a, a, a notorious liar, uh, who uh, who nearly uh, uh, turned Hungary into a bankrupt state, um, and uh, this this is a credibility problem. There was an elite which failed Hungary. And uh, a lot of people see uh, a part of the media as part of that elite that failed them, and um, I think that's that, that's a part what we what we should uh, somehow uh, get over. Um, and then you know, I think you asked, but but, but I'm, I'm I'm constantly asked how how people do the the, the propaganda thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of one of the reasons is 2006, actually that that they see themselves as as, as warriors of a bigger fight, um, and for them Orban is right, the other guy is uh, not. Uh, let's call that other guy uh, George Soros. Yeah. Um, so so giving out lies is somehow you know a side effect of the bigger uh, bigger fight the fight that they are right. It, it, it can be that, 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 that on, a, on a daily basis they are wrong, but on the big one, they are right. right. So this helps them. And then we can be critical again, because uh, I think that, that, that partly uh, uh, the critical media, uh, out of all the frustration and all the, all, all the pessimism which comes with our, with our job, we, we bullied. Uh, those guys uh, uh, really hard, so so they act, we gave them a sense that the elite is you know not taking taking them seriously. So there's no easy answer that that they are cynical and earning a lot of money. Uh, surely there are those who are cynical and earning a lot of money, mm. uh, but but a part of them 
believe in their job, what they do, and they partly believe it because we fail on a daily basis. And obviously that makes this much more powerful when it's actually, you know, under late communism, nobody believed any of the ideology. It was sort of go along to get along and, 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 and you know, try to have as peaceful a life as possible. This sounds different. This sounds like it's, it re there really is ideological commitment and belief behind it. Marius, does this ring true to you? What, 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 what are, are the practitioners on the panel are, uh, uh, have pointed to as, as sort of key turning points in, 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 in building the system? Yes, I to uh, totally. I, I, I think, yes, this is how, how it happened. And I think two, uh, there are two aspects to, to, it, to, to think about. One is uh, the uh, talking only ab after 2010. Uh, this is, it's really important to think about the years before that, before the, the systematic attack on the media started. But after 2010, I think one thing important to, th to, to look into is to understand the, the shift in, in the journalistic profession towards the, the urban camp, because at that time you had media outlets and you had journalists working in these media outlets. I mentioned the purge of the public television where the critical journalists left, then after the takeover of Origo you had journalists leaving, um, and I think more has to be understood about the shift within the profession, because now, based on the, um, uh, the various interviews that, that we do, and I think you know better, when you, when you talk to people in the public television, for example, many of them, they really believe in that mission. It's not that they are forced to do it. Many of them, they tell you that, you know, this is the mission that they have to, to be a, a channel of the, the government. They think that many governments in the world have their own channel and it's very le legitimate for, for these organizations, for, for governments and public administrations to run their own media. Of course, I, I, I know that not all of them believe like that, but I think this is important to think because it has to do with how actually propaganda works. And the second part of it, so one is the human uh, side, and the second is the more technical side, I would say, how actually it works in practice. And here is something that has to be studied, but there are many ways to, to, to do that. Again, referring to the public television, we, we learned how, how it works, how the news put is, is, is produced, uh, the, uh, all the television, all the, bro the, the two broadcasters, the radio and television and the, the news media are working together in one big unit. And in fact, the news output that they produce, they have, uh, they distribute to other media outlets. We, we did a content analysis study and we were uh, surprised to see that actually they send these news outlets with recommendations for publication. And this is in the system. They say this is important or this is relevant. And this is a signal for various media outlets uh, receiving this kind of output, uh, how to put it, where to place it in the, in the news media and so on. This is just a very small part of the system. It's a much bigger system, but I think another important thing to, to, to think about and to study is to understand how it actually works in practice because I think understanding that offers you clues and offers people who want to support independent media an idea of where to go and where to find the entry points actually in this in this uh, sort of market, if I can still call it that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mark, go ahead. Yes, but if you want an easy laugh, uh, I think the, 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 the creation of the Death Star uh, last autumn, uh, Andras mentioned, was uh, partly due to the fact that, that that they don't have enough people to, 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 to make an effective uh, machine out of it. That uh, they want to control everything and they, they collect it so much that now they are not having enough qualified people to do that job. So that's why they had to, uh, to, 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 to centralize it to build this Death Star. That, 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 that it's much more effective, that, that there were two problems. One, the oligarchs have uh, stolen an awful lot of money out of the system. And two, um, even in that structure, uh, journalists were not always you know, on, on the right track where they had to be. So right now uh, we have the situation, and I always laugh. You know, if if, if I go go to a place, they always think that that now I'm coming from a small Putin land, and 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 that I'm 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 beaten up and I'm censored, but actually uh, the, the ones who are censored, they are working for the government. Uh -huh. They are not allowed to write whatever they want. They are not allowed to write what they think, and they. They have to stick to the plan, the 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 the, the mind behind the communication has, and uh, so yeah, 
we can be self-critical, but at the same time, it, it, sometimes there's, uh, there, there's ground for a good laugh. Um, I would like to uh, open it up for questions because we only have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so what, what you, I saw your hand go up first, uh, ma'am. I'm actually the editor of the biggest dinosaur in Slovakia and ethnic Hungarian. And I completely agree with Martin that in order to control power, you need pressure. And my question is, how is it uh, with smaller independent projects, their cooperation? Because when I spoke to independent, independently to some journalists, they enter this rhetoric that we are more independent than the others. And I noticed that that uh, especially in big breaking news, you don't have the type of cooperation, for example, we are able to do in Slovakia, that if there is a breaking news, my big newspaper, we are pushing it and joining it. So how, how is it in Hungary and why is it so that, you know, even those remaining independent journalists aren't able to join forces? I don't know, who, whoever wants to uh, address that, feel free. We are Hungarians, that's the answer. I mean, historically, it has been a very divided uh, nation, uh, very fragmented. But uh, I think, well, for example, if I can bring a counter example, the Direct 36, uh, we have our own website, we publish our stories there. But we also, in fact, we, we always publish our stories first with partners. So we have, it's very simply, you know, for us, it makes sense because that's how we can reach a big audience. Uh, immediately. So we have 444, which is uh, one of the most popular news sites in Hungary. That's our most frequent partner. That's where we publish our stories. But we did, we, 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 we did projects together with RTL, the biggest TV channel uh, in Hungary, and they often pick up our stories. Uh, we even did, uh, when we did a business story, we teamed up with the local edition of Forbes magazine. So there is, there is uh, a cooperation, but it's, you know, it's a, um, I mean, uh, by nature, it's a competitive business. I mean, you want to beat the others. I mean, sometimes it makes sense to team up, uh, uh, but uh, uh, but I think the the competition is is healthy. I think what's what's miss missing is that, uh, and uh, we should have more you know conversations to talk about our uh, profession. Last year, I went to uh, Germany. The the the, uh, the yearly conference of the German uh, investigative reporters, and you know, I was amazed that there were 1,000 people. That, you know, in, in, in Hungary, we don't even have an organization, an association for investigative uh, uh, journalists, let alone having a, a big conference where we exchange ideas and we exchange methods. So I think that that would be more uh, more helpful if you if you had that. No, there is no. Sorry. sorry. So, so there's no good answer. Uh, I'm very much disappointed in, in, in my generation of, new, of, 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 of editors and, 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 and media makers, why we are not more connected, why we are not speaking more about our profession, uh, our uh, daily struggle, uh, our problems. Um, it, 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 it's really frustrating. Uh, I think that, that, that we inherited from an older generation all the ethical problems I mentioned, uh, but I think that we are less capable of, uh, of, uh, uh, of cooperation as they were. So but that's my point of view. Uh, you have the microphone and then, and then I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you. So, yeah, and then, and then you, yes. Hi, thanks for this. I'm Natalie Nugred. I'm from The Guardian. I was previously with Le Monde, and so um, I've lo been looking at European journalism for a while. Thank you so much for this really, really um, in useful and, and, and uh, interesting uh, depiction. My question is probably connects with the previous one, which is um, why and how would it make sense and does, would it help for, for you, for independent journalists in Hungary, uh, to have some kind of better support or networking or mechanism from other European journalists, some kind of platform or some kind of, you know, you mentioned this annual meeting in Germany, but I'm thinking at a European level, because as you said, 
Hungary may well be a pioneer in, in, in this picture, right? So should we not be thinking of um, looking for solutions where like-minded, worried journalists across Europe come together and try to, try to build some kind of solidarity platform. I don't know what it would look like. Maybe it would just help you get your content out there or, or you know, more easily or draw, build more pressure. Perhaps it would be a better solidarity mechanisms, you know, coming in, reacting faster, not waiting for the New York Times, however, you know, fascinating it is, to pick up the story, right. not, not, le not leave you desperately waiting for the New York Times or The Guardian to pick up a story. Um, before you feel that you're getting enough attention or enough support. Thank you. That's an excellent question. And, and it's one of the things that I wanted to the panel to address is this uh, issue of strategies of resistance. What, and, 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 you know, whether that means mobilizing domestic resources or organization or reaching out to, uh, for international solidarity. So uh, maybe, maybe the two practitioners should address this, but, but, uh, but feel free as well, Mary. Yeah, I think that would be that would be helpful. In fact, we can already see the positive effect of uh, of having uh, international support and, and being part of international communities. I mean, we are lucky to be part of uh, two of the biggest uh, investigative networks, the OCCRP and uh, ICIJ. We've been part of uh, some of the biggest investigations like the Panama Papers, so, uh, and we got help from colleagues in Germany and from, from other countries. We did stories together with the Washington Post, we, we, and we were the ones who approached them. We, said, we, we told them that we have a story idea, would you like to work with us, and they did. We did a story last year together with Novaya Gazeta, uh, and that worked out uh, really well. Also, and uh, nobody should take this personally, I'm sure that everybody who's present is, is, is an exception, but we've also had some bad experience when foreign journalists, some of the big names, I'm not going to name them, parachuted in Hungary, took our reporting, didn't credit us, no links, no attribution, nothing, and you know, I mean, we don't want special treatment. You know, we want to be treated like uh, other big names, you know. We are, we are the ones who are putting our neck on the line uh, in Hungary. So, yeah, simply just uh, getting the credit, you know, it means uh, as a nonprofit, we are sometimes, you know, we are getting, uh, we are seeking grants internationally. I mean, it means a lot if we can show that, you know, our story, uh, stories have, have impact internationally as well. But, but the Guardian, we always had good experience with the Guardian. I, ca I can tell you that, but really. Yes, yeah, so we need more discussions. We need, we need more debates. We, we need more conversation. And, and, and if, uh, if on foreign terrain, it's good. If in, if in Hungary, it's even better. Um, so I think that, that, that somehow we Hungarians should build up uh, first uh, such a uh, such a cooperation back in Hungary, but uh, there are good signs. I, I can I can tell one as well. We we started uh, ahead of the European uh, parliamentary elections uh, uh, um, uh, a cooperation with uh, six other European uh, newspapers. Um, it's called Europe's far, far right research group and uh, research network and and and. Uh, and how it now turns out to be that 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 Havigi is basically you know playing the correspondent for them. So so the the the, the Liberation or 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 Gazeta Viborce is having a more accurate uh, picture of Hungary because because the, the stories are written uh, uh, in Hungary. So if we want to see how Russia is influencing the far right parties in in Europe. It's a Hungarian uh, who is writing about Fidesz. And, and it helps, I think, the others, and it helps us because it b brings us financing. So it brings us money um, because we have a grant for that. Uh, so I think this, this, this could be a good way forward if we, if we could, you know, not, not, not be the, the, the correspondent, but, the, but, less, but, but at least be the fact checker of some Western partner institutions who can collect money, donations uh, that they are helping us. 
So I think that that, that would be an unproblematic thing. That it's it's not you know an institution which is paying you an investigate an investigative piece where, where where the credibility is starting to 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 to, to get fuzzy. So yeah. We only have a couple of minutes left, and I see the barbarians pressing at the gate back there for the 11 o'clock panel. So I, I, the woman in white, you had a, your hand raised a couple of times, so I'd I, I just like to give, this will be the last question. Yeah. Uh, several members of the panel um, mentioned Origo. I wondered if they'd like to comment on Google's decision to donate some money to Origo as part of the um, Digital News Initiative, which apparently has now been rescinded. But how did that happen in the first place? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, with my other hat, which is the, uh, the founder of Media Power Monitor, the website that, that drove the story, I can tell you that uh, I think they announced last night that they withdrew the funding. Uh, now, commenting on that, I, uh, we talked to various journalists in Hungary. Some of them believe that it was a mistake. They didn't truly check the media outlet. Others believe not. So I, I think the, the, the truth is somewhere <coughs> in the middle. But it's good that Google withdrew the funding. I think we have to end it there. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for, for coming and listening to uh, uh, what I think was a very interesting, very important panel. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you.